USA Ultimate is proud to present the 2016 US Open Ultimate Championship. And we are set for the first men's semifinal, a game that needs very little introduction. Seattle Sockeye and San Francisco Revolver, two titans in the Ultimate community, meet here at Mead Stadium in Kingston, Rhode Island, to battle for a spot in tomorrow's title game. It's three versus four and one versus two in the semis because Ironside knocked off Revolver a couple days ago. So Ironside, the only undefeated team in the men's division, Sockeye and Revolver both with a loss. Hi again, everybody. Evan Leffler and Ian Toner, and this is going to be fun. These two teams need very little introduction. They met for the national title last year. Revolver came out on top. But the interesting thing, both teams going through a bunch of changes in mixing and matching early in the season. Exactly. Two long-time long -time offensive stalwarts, Robbie Cahill and Ashlyn Joy, no longer a part of the Revolver squad. And Danny Karlinski still returning from the World Championships, unable to compete with Sakai this weekend. Well, we can talk a lot about the guys who aren't here, but we'll spend most of the time talking about the guys who are. And Seattle Sakai led again by Roger Crafts, won three titles in four years back in the mid-2000s. Without Danny Karlinski, Simon Montague will be, by and large, the center handler. He played for Sockeye before, but it's been a few years. He's been in Minneapolis with his uh, college team in Sub-Zero. Yeah, first time playing for Sockeye since 2012 for Simon Montague. Very capable handler. He was one of the many players who uh, was also invited to try out for the world uh, world teams for the USA. Unfortunately, didn't make the cut, but he's a tremendous player in his own right. Very capable of filling that central handler role. It's been fun to watch him get involved. Trent Dillon has made his Sockeye debut this weekend as well. And for San Francisco Revolver, some new names like Grant Lindsley and George Stubbs. But for this four-time national champion, and the fact that they don't have Ashlyn Joy, who's been the quarterback in the general, it thrusts Eli Kearns into that position. He's a revolver veteran, but this is a new responsibility. Yeah, Eli Kearns, a product of UC Davis, traditionally playing on the D-line for the revolver unit. He's gone over, made the switch to the offensive unit, trying to take on some of those quarterbacking responsibilities. He's got the throws, he's got the poise. Will he be able to live up to the pressure? Revolver and Sockeye, San Francisco and and Seattle, the early edge in the season series. Coming up next here from Rhode Island. The 2016 U.S. Open Ultimate Championships are presented by Discraft Ultra Star, the official disc of USA Ultimate. Discraft Ultra Star is now available at over 1,900 U.S. retail locations, including all Dick Sporting Goods and Hibbit Sports Stores. Buy Discover Newport. Choose your own adventure in Newport, Rhode Island. Get the inside scoop on where to stay and where to play at discovernewport.org. And by USA Ultimate, the national governing body for the sport of Ultimate in the United States. For more information or to find out where to play Ultimate in your area, visit usaultimate.org. Two teams that are very familiar with one another, but some changes to both teams from 2015 to 2016. A lot of familiar names in Sockeye starting lineup. Justin Lim, the Carlton product with Zan Rankin, who uh, grew up in the Bay Area, went to Cal and played for the San Francisco Flamethrowers in the AUDL for a season. Mike Caldwell, the timeless vet with O'Brien, Montague, Murray, and the deep threat, Matt Rader. Always dangerous. For San Francisco Revolver, Josh Wiseman back after a year out. He tore his ACL. He's the true Revolver veteran. He's been around since the beginning. Christian Johnson, the UNC product, and Joel Schlockett was unbelievable at the World Championships, leading the United States men's team in goals. We talked about Eli Kearns in the open, and Eli's childhood pal Simon Higgins has surged into a larger offensive role as well with no Bo Kittredge and Cassidy Rasmussen this weekend. Yeah, Bo Kittredge able to fight through a challenging knee injury to compete at the World Championships last weekend. Unfortunately, unable to return and compete this weekend, so Simon Higgins becomes that dominant deep threat on the offense. Picture perfect conditions here at the home of University of Rhode Island Ram football, Mead Stadium. Just a few stray clouds, mostly sunshine here in the Granite State of Rhode Island. Revolver in black getting set to pull to Sockeye in white in their homemade jerseys for this tournament. There's a personal flair about it, that's for sure. 
San Francisco Revolver and Nathan White left his gold medal on the sidelines as he launched the pull to get things started. And initially Simon Montague in the five shirt receives the disc. You can see Patrick Bayless of Revolver poaching into the lane. And here's the underneath shot to Matt Raider. Raider and White, those two were teammates in London. Here's Rankin and a big layout D from Hagen, but the disc caught regardless by Caldwell. Mike Caldwell in his 17th season with Sockeye. Contact there again between Bayless and Raider. What are the things that you'll be looking for early in this game, Ian? I want to see, as Hagen gets a block there, I want to see what the defensive looks each unit throws at the other to try and get them out of their big man isolation sets. You've played in big early season games like this against teams that you expect to see later on. Can you get a mental edge going forward by winning a game like this in July? Oh, absolutely. Guys on these teams are keeping a mental scorecard all season long. And those are the types of things that fuel people on the track. Sanchez to Marcy, and the game begins with a revolver break. Great poach by Hagen to first get that block and turnover, and great efficiency after the turn by this revolver D-line. Rankin looking downfield, thinks he's got a swing option, but Hagen peels off. Looks like he threw it right to him. Revolver has always had an army of defenders. One of the reasons they've won four titles in the last six years. And a nice shot there from Sanchez to Marcy. Nice touch on that inside out throw. Marcy known as one of the steadier and more reliable handlers, not only for San Francisco Revolver, but also in the American Ultimate Disc League. So Jordan Marcy gets Revolver on the board. And Revolver throws out a, a totally new defensive line out there. George Stubbs will lead this one. Another great storyline coming into this season. Stubbs, who had been a star of Ironside for many years, a captain in his final few years. After hiking the Pacific Crest Trail last year and taking the season off, he's set up home base in the Bay Area and is now competing with his longtime rival, San Francisco Revolver. Raider cranked it deep to Justin Lim. Reset to O'Brien. Lior Gival on the mark, and O'Brien picks up the assist to the human Labrador retriever, Donnie Clark, with his first goal of the game in the semifinals. Donnie Clark, known for his straight line speed, really winning the battle to the cone there. He has called himself just a dog chasing the disc. And he beats Lucas Dahlman to the corner. Nice deep shot from Raider. Able to find Lim just a few yards outside the end zone. These two teams have met for championships. Seems very frequently. It was 2013, the first year in Frisco. Revolver over. Sockeye in a, in a good game, and then Johnny Bravo in 2014 uh, winning the championship game. 2015 again, though, Revolver and Sockeye in the finals. Revolver and Sockeye met in the finals of the World Club Championships in Lecco, Italy back in 2014. There's a lot of history between these two. No doubt that these are Two of the more consistent and powerful programs in the men's division over the last two decades. Two teams worthy of a bigger crowd than the one they're playing in front of right now, frankly. 
maybe 4th of July weekend, but I'm glad this is where my seat is right now. No question. So Eli Kearns will trot it forward. He'll be picked up by the very pesky defender Duncan Lynn. Kearns from the brick mark. And this is Grant Lindsley, another newcomer to the revolver scene. Minnesota Sub-Zero in the past, and Kearns lets it fly. Josh Wiseman just falling shy of the disc. Interesting that Wiseman pointed to his chest and claimed responsibility for that one. Reed Koss launches looking for Trent Dillon. Trent Dillon, in his first point ever with Seattle Sockeye, launched a huck to Koss for a score. And there's the break back for the Seattle defense as Koss hits Hussein Carnegie. Another Seattle rookie and a guy who's played very well throughout the weekend in Rhode Island. And here's the turnover, the wind kind of bobbling that disc up and down just out of the reach of Wiseman. And then after the turn, no one picks up Dylan as he takes off deep. I think there was a little miscommunication on who was guarding which man after the turnover. And Sakai taking full advantage of that miscommunication striking deep. Now it's been interesting to watch Trent Dillon the past couple of weeks. Of course, he was a member of the USA team that won gold in London. And when he was playing with Pittsburgh, there was so much responsibility on his shoulders and the distinguished nature of the Callahan Award being thrust upon him as we look at Hussein Carnegie. Dillon looked much more relaxed playing with Team USA. And I think in the 76 shirt for Sakai, has been even more relaxed assimilating into this lineup because he's not being counted on to be the emotional leader and the physical leader and everything else that goes into leading a college team that has those kind of expectations. Exactly. You talk about when, when college teams and, and any team for that matter is having discussions about who their leaders will be. I think one of the primary conversations that happens is, okay, are we willing to sacrifice this player's further development? Are we okay with where they're at now? Because they are fully aware that, you know, their focus is on the rest of the team's development and team's cohesion, not further individual development. And this is a, a great new opportunity for Trent that he hasn't had in quite some time. Oh, uncharacteristic drop there, right through the hands of Michael Spear, a revolver rookie coming to the Bay Area from Atlanta. I was chatting with Mike Payne, the head coach of Revolver, a couple days ago. He said he's very high on Mike Spear. He he has great field sense. Still getting into the Revolver level of shape. Reed Koss takes a timeout. Seattle will have the disc. Mike Payne, worth noting, is not here at the moment. He had to head back to the Bay Area to handle some personal issues. So Yokawa Oka, veteran Revolver defensive handler, moving to the coaching ranks this season. He is in charge of things. Got a quick look of Yo. Yeah, there's Yokawa Oka. Funny, funny to look at the, uh, here's, here's the Seattle huddle and looking at the revolver huddle, they're trying to imitate some of the, they were trying to imitate some of the Japanese timeout cheers as well that a number of their players picked up from the world championships a few weeks ago. So Sakai with the disc after the drop by Spear. For makeshift jerseys, I think these are pretty nice ones. I'll say I've seen better, but I'm sure they're proud of them. Koss launches a beautiful shot. And into the end zone, Justin Lim collects for a 3-1 lead. Unfortunate mistake there from the San Francisco offense. I'm, nine times out of 10, I'm sure Michael Spear catches that disc, but Sakai ruthlessly efficient after that 
turnover, calling a timeout to set their play. Reed Koss doing what he does best, striking deep. Sam Hartman's to the end zone for Justin Lim and the Sakai score. And a very efficient performance here. Three, San Francisco one. As Sakai jumps out to the quick 3-1 lead. Well, it started with the huck. And then Harkness picks up the assist. Twenty. Got your hand. Duncan Lynn moving the disc, and Harkness in his eighth year with Sockeye. Feels like he's been around for a while, but he's been around less than half the time of a Mike Caldwell. Sockeye's tournament began with a loss Friday morning to Madison Club, a game that Sockeye began the game with two consecutive breaks, only to give it up. It was 8-7 at the half, and then 12 all late. Madison scored the final two goals, both via breaks, to win it. Although Madison fell to Florida United and Chicago Machine to miss out on semis. Sockeye running the table, and you can see some of the growing pains, perhaps, of this Eli Kearns led Revolver offense. Another turnover for Revolver, and the Sockeye defense has been known to go on great runs of breaks. Great grab by Spencer Wallace. And into the end zone, it's four now in a row. Four straight for the fish. Sockeye defense preventing that first throw that the revolver offense wanted, not able to get a, a nice in cut. And after the turnover, here's Spencer Wallace, full extension, shoulder high, saving possession and making sure that Sockeye has a chance to cash in the break. Harkness with the inside shot to Murray, and Murray with the open lane, continuing into the end zone for Dong Ying Chen out of the University of Washington. And call him D.Y., very speedy handler defender, and on a turn, Chen has been a voracious cutter downfield. Looks like another timeout called here by Revolver. I think Sakai's defense so far, their pressure, their junk looks have done a great job of shutting down the revolver offense first options. Traditionally, maybe they've had someone backing Bo Kittredge, and Bo has always been able to catch that first underpass. Simon Higgins hasn't quite commanded the same respect just yet. Do you think he can? I don't know that he has the same speed as Bo. I think if he can establish himself a little more and consistently make teams pay mm -hmm. for fronting him, I think that's when you might start to see that shift. But a, a Matt Raider or someone of that caliber can match up step for step with Simon today. No sign of rain today, but the umbrellas can shield the sun too. The game began with a break for Revolver, but a hold and three consecutive breaks for Sockeye. Yeah, we got to look at the crowd there. That was Arnie Johnson, uh, Christian Johnson's father. Does his best to make it out to every tournament, and he'll be the first to say that, you know, in years past, Christian has survived on some of his, and, and actually excelled on the basis of some of his natural athletic talent, but. Since moving to the Bay Area, he's become even more committed to additional training and committed to weightlifting, and it's made a difference in his strength and stamina and overall contributions on the field. Kearns has four targets downfield. Johnson, Wiseman, Lindsley, and Higgins. Here's Lindsley. 
Marked by Koss. Higgins with a touch on the under. Defended by Matt Russell. Wiseman gets the reset to Chris Kasednar. An interesting game for Kasednar. Longtime Seattle Sockeye player who's just recently in the last few years made the move to the Bay and started playing with Revolver. In his third year and they're looking deep to Schlockett doing what he does. Kearns finding Schlockett to break the 4-0 run from Seattle. And Evan, you were there on the ground in London, but from what I understand, they started affectionately referring to Joel Schlockett as Goal Schlockett because of his nose for the end zone. He just takes off from the handler set. Trent Dillon is unaware, and Schlockett's got him beat. Those two were teammates just a week ago in London. Yep. Eight days ago, USA beating Japan. 15-11, I believe. Schlockett was the leading scorer for the Americans. Arakawa led the Japanese along with Kichikawa, Korono, and of course the great Masahiro Matsuno, who has really been a mysterious presence in the world ultimate community, but proved that he is an equal to the great players from anywhere around the world. San Francisco Revolver represented the United States at WUGC four years ago in Japan, winning gold over Great Britain. A universe point clash with Canada in the semifinals 2012. A lot has changed from Revolver 2012 to Revolver 2016, but there are some similar mainstays as Matt Raider breaks free and has the easy score. Montague with a gorgeous shot. And Seattle on virtually one throw retakes a three score lead. And I think in years past, traditionally, when people have thought of the sockeye offense, they've thought of that quick small ball movement but as Matt Rader has become more of a central figure of the offense, he also provides the ability to stretch the field and be a credible deep threat. You know, not to say that Phil Murray or BJ Sefton haven't provided that themselves as well, but Rader showing off his deep capabilities here and Montague matching with a great throw right on the money. You think Seattle's offensive style could change a little bit? with a guy like Montague quarterbacking things compared to someone like Danny Karlinski? Absolutely, and I'll be interested to see how they adjust their offense going forward as Karlinski returns and comes back into the fold. So Simon Montague with his first assist, and we are just about ready to be joined by a special guest up here in the booth, Heather Ann Brower, co-founder and chair of U.S. Ultimate's Girls Ultimate Movement, also a gold medalist for Team USA at the Beach World Championships in Dubai. Heather uh, Ann, welcome, and uh, how you enjoyed the weekend in Rhode Island? It's It's been great. It's been great to watch this level of play so early in the season. Yeah, it is a nice change of pace from what Ultimate was five years ago. The Triple Crown Tour has changed things, and. Obviously, there's been a lot of great women's ultimate as well. And uh, as Revolver shoots it long and another gorgeous shot, Grant Lindsley hauls it in for the score. Uh, Heather Ann Brower, what has uh, it been like this weekend with the, the girls' ultimate movement? What is the, the mission of the organization? And tell us a little bit about the, the, the progress that you have seen so far. It's been a great weekend. We had the opportunity to give a presentation on all the work that we've been doing. GUM was founded in 2014 after some discussions about how we could get more girls involved in playing the sport and retain girls in our sport. Um, since then, it's been a community movement that has really exploded around the country, finding fun, unique opportunities to get girls playing, to get girls loving the sport, and add some leadership components also to Ultimate. In what ways have you seen things change since GUM began? We've seen a lot more girls participating at the competitive levels at the U16, U19 divisions at the Youth Club Championships, which is the national championship opportunity for youth. And 
What do you think are some of the next steps, other conversations that people need to continue to have to make sure that we're not just seeing a few instances of U16, U19 success that's continuing to trickle down further into youth levels and beyond. Definitely. I think that's really important. Introducing girls to Ultimate earlier is really a, a big opportunity that we have, and so we've started rolling out curriculums to do that. Heather Ann Brower of the Girls Ultimate Movement joining us, the co-founder and chair of GUM. And as Sakai has the disc again, 5-3 the score midway through this first half of the first men's semifinal. We'll see Boston Ironside and Chicago Machine later today. Big fake from Mario O'Brien. Heather, one of the things I, I remember your team mentioning in the uh, Girls Ultimate Movement presentation here at the convention, um, you're going to be focusing on some new branding. Uh, and Octavia Payne of Molly Brown and also a gold medalist from the women's team is going to be the face of the movement, so to speak. Can you talk about uh, the efforts there and uh, her selection and what made you choose her? Sure, definitely. Um, the high school and middle school girls that we've interviewed along the way have talked about the importance of role models and really having those women at the forefront of who they see and that they inspire, are inspired by them. And so she is a incredible player. I don't know if you saw her 3Ds yesterday in one point. <laughs> uh, those were remarkable. I, I'm sure glad I was watching that game. <laughs> Speaking of incredible players, nice layout there from Justin Lim, scoring on the bid for his second goal to make it 6-3. Opie Payne-esque here on the bid in the end zone from Lim. Full extension. No revolver defender is going to have a shot at that one. I'm sure, sure Phil Murray wishes he might have put that a little more on the money, but nothing Justin Lim can't handle. What is the age that you're trying to get young women involved in the sport? So across the country, depending on the area, we have as young as elementary school out playing. Uh, across the entire country, there's high school in many of the cities getting middle school up and going and really getting elementary because kids are getting introduced to so many different sports at that young age. Um, our hope is someday that nationwide we have elementary school ultimate in the schools leading up to middle school and high school. It is a cool vision, that's for sure. Phil Murray with his second assist. First one was to D.Y. Chen, this time to Justin Lim. And the San Francisco offense returning to the field. What, what sorts of communities are you seeing lead the way in that area of growth? I mean, obviously Seattle is a hotbed that comes to mind. Seattle's definitely a hotbed. We're seeing a lot of growth in the Triangle, North Carolina, the Boston area, Minnesota. Um, pockets are starting to pop up and grow from those, those spaces. The Bay Area is a huge space for girls playing ultimate. Kern's looking for Higgins, and this has become a bit of a track meet. A festival of deep shots here in the first half as the childhood friends from Alameda, California connect to make it 6-4. That's got to give Kern some confidence. He hadn't completed a deep shot just yet this game, but he gives and goes, gets power position. A great rip to Simon Higgins. A throw they've completed to each other a number of times before. Well, this is game two of a quadruple header of coverage here at the U.S. Open semifinals from Kingston, Rhode Island as Higgins hauls in the score. 3.30 today, we'll see the first women's semi. Seattle Riot and Denver Molly Brown. And one of the craziest stories from the women's bracket is the fact that for the first time since I can remember, for the first time in forever, to quote a character from Frozen, <laughs> the ladies of San Francisco Fury are not in the semifinals that speaks to the growing depth in the women's game, which I think, unless you're a San Francisco fan, you have to look at as a positive the evolution of the sport in the division. Definitely, the parity that we've seen in the women's division over the last couple of years has been just incredible. Originally, it was just two teams always in that finals, and now we've brought in all these other teams. And watching Molly Brown play Fury yesterday and play Scandal yesterday, those games were incredible from the start. They were close games, fun to watch all the plays that happened. Uh, and seeing that parity and that level of play in the women's division across the board, not just in semis and finals, is really exciting for girls watching the sport. And we're going to see one of the uh, regional outreach coordinators for gum Claire Chastain competing in that uh, Molly Brown riot matchup in a few short hours. Yes. 
Claire was really involved in the early gum conversations and has played a big role in getting the girls' ultimate movement off the ground. And I noticed that a number of the women at the uh, World Championships last weekend were sporting gum headbands and other attire. I'm sure Claire had something to do with that. Yeah, I think her and also Five Ultimate has been a huge supporter of us, and Rory has helped bring that, bring the gum headbands out and get those out to girls and uh, women playing the sport. And even men are sporting them at the uh, World Games. It's really great to see that support across the board. If Rory Tipcomb wants something to happen, it usually gets done. And that's, a, five ultimate. and that's a pretty interesting thing to do because it, Rory's Twitter presence is known as Rory's headband, so to get her to change her headband, <laughs> that's no small feat. <laughs> a cause she's clearly committed to. Montague determined to break the mark, does to Murray. And we have now played six consecutive points, turnover free, as Justin Lim Certainly not to be confused with the most uh, dynamic athletes on the Sockeye roster has now scored three of their seven goals. Another shot straight from Phil Murray to Lim in the front of the end zone. This is the quality, you know, turnover free ultimate that we're expecting to see from these teams. Heather Ann Brower, last thing before we let you go, if someone wants to get more involved in the gum movement, help out in their community, perhaps get support from the mothership, how do they go about doing so? Um, they can check us out at gum.usaultimate.org and also our Twitter account, which is Gum Ultimate. Those are great ways to find opportunities for young girls in your city to go out and play, to volunteer, to get involved in our organization. Molly Brown Riot, who do you have? That's a hard call. I can't make that call. I have great friends on both teams. I'm really excited for that game. Well, he's not asking who you're rooting for. He's asking who, who he I thinks is going to win. Who, yeah, I, have no, win. I have no idea. You, you know, you know everyone on both teams. Who's I do. I do. I have no idea. Well, <laughs> I was hoping you weren't going to ask that question. <laughs> actually, <laughs> Heather Ann Brower, co-founder slash chair of the USA Ultimates Girls Ultimate Movement. Thanks so much for joining us. Enjoy the rest of the Ultimate this weekend. Thank you. Thank you. 7-4 Seattle leads San Francisco. Eli Kearns in the revolver offense was broken a couple times in a row. Three times in a row as a matter of fact. Johnson to Kearns. Higgins taking off. Carnegie can't catch up. 7-5. So now three assists for Eli Kearns and a couple of goals for Simon. I'm wondering what Higgins will have to show to people to gradually earn that Kittredge level of respect. Because while he may not be 100% of Bo, that speed right there against Hussein Carnegie might be 93, 94, 95 percent of Bo. Now he's young and he doesn't have the same level of accomplishment, but I think it's in the ballpark for yeah. him to reach that level. You know, maybe he just needs to jump over a guy and maybe. someone get it on camera. I mean, you're, you're speaking facetiously, but <laughs> that's honestly not all that far-fetched. Bo became a legend 10 years ago when he did that. He became a larger-than-life individual. And Simon plays the game with a goofy smile on his face. No fault of his own. Right. That's just his personality. Now, Bo has a goofy smile on his face for sometimes, too. But it's, it's a different personality than one of, of Higgins. And the interesting thing is, I, I don't think many people would disagree with this. I think Simon might even be a better thrower than Bo is today. Yeah. And so when you're speaking to, okay, if I'm a defense, do I want to force this guy in or force this guy out? You know, forcing Simon under is more dangerous than forcing Bo under because you have a more dangerous thrower with the disc in their hands. This first half has flown by. We've only had four turnovers and 12 points, and all of them came in the opening five points. No turns since the score was four to one. Any young handlers would do 
really well to learn from the play of Simon Montague. Oh, oh. Tremendous layout D from Greg Cohen. He landed on his shoulder and appears shaken up. Revolver athletic trainer Malika Anderson over to check on Cohen, who has grown into a larger role. That's just a tremendous play. Kind of a delayed reaction on yeah, the injury. And, and I wonder if the injury didn't necessarily come from the impact. Maybe it came when he was trying to push himself up back off the ground. Cohen being checked out by Chris Kasednar and Malika Anderson. George Stubbs will pick up the disc. Marked by Rankin. Stubbs has looked very comfortable on the revolver D line, especially as a field general off a turnover this weekend. Yeah, I think that D line handler role um, is perhaps a more natural fit for him. He's a big thrower. He can use his athleticism to chase people down. And just as we say that, the disc goes through his hands. Revolver turnover. So the first point of the game that has involved multiple turnovers. Sockeye with another chance to take it to half. Where the game began with a break. San Francisco scored on Seattle's offensive point. Which means Revolver will receive to start the second half. Foul call. Foul call. Yeah, you need to drop one. Yeah, I did. Yeah, you're bumping them. Well, the second, you, you got okay. The second one, it's, it goes. It's so you keep, you can keep calling con contact, contact all you want. Yeah, let's let's take a step off the mark because yeah. you're bumping them a lot. Hey, side Head observer Mitch Dangler stepping in there, possibly on the er on the verge of issuing a blue card or a TMF for. The physical mark, Mario O'Brien repeatedly calling contact to reset the stall count. Lior Duvall, young revolver rookie, reset. Montague forced to sky for it in the end zone. And there was contact and perhaps an injury. Lucas Dahlman is down. One of Revolver's captains this year. 2013 made the transition over from the mixed division after great success with Polar Bears. And won a national title. And and Seth Reinhardt kind of coming into the back of Dahlman, forcing him to go to the ground and oh, maybe the elbow bore the brunt of that impact. If Seattle had quote, caused that injury, Dalton would have had the option to stay on the field. But because play stopped as a result of the injury, which the observer deemed was caused by his teammate Reinhardt, he could not stay, he had no option, he had to leave. Exactly. And there's Cohen getting taped up. All sorts of things they do with tape these days, I hardly understand. You know, I've had some experience with KT tape. I. I don't know how much more effective it actually is than a regular well-structured tape job, but I'm no physical therapist. One thing about Simon Montague as a handler, he's got great size, so when he needs to go sky for a disc in his own end zone, he's got the wherewithal and the height to do it. Up line, knocked away, but it should have been caught. Missed opportunity there from Byron Liu. And looking long, Liu tipped it again. You gotta be kidding me. Justin Lim bids for the deflected score. And a lot of life lessons learned on that point for Byron Liu as Seattle takes half. Well, the second Mac, he definitely could not have caught. That was a full extension layout. Montague shooting deep, underthrown just a bit. Incredible effort from Lou. And then Justin Lim doesn't give up on the play. That's his fourth goal this half. And Sockeye heads into halftime with an 8-5 lead on the defending champion San Francisco Revolver. 
You don't think he could have caught that? I think that would have been a tall order. I think the first block on the underneath throw, that one, Byron definitely could have caught. Uh, unfortunately, this might be more likely to be on the not top 10 for Byron Liu. It was a spectacular grab, though, nothing to take away from Justin Lim, who had a sensational half of ultimate for Seattle Sockeye. Three straight breaks from one to one to four to one was the difference. We've played on serve for eight straight points since that. Uh, nope, 70, Julian Hausman. Yep. Can we ask him why he's not playing this weekend? I'm positive, no. Yeah. Yeah. Julian Hausman set to join us down on the field, Seattle, uh, up 8-5. And Julian, uh, what have you seen from your team in the first half? Whole lot of energy, whole lot of fire. Justin Williams got an open in the end zone. What was it like on Friday morning after Madison Club beat you guys? What was the message from the leadership? You know, I mean, this is early season for us. We're just coming together really for the first time. Guys have been in a lot of different places uh, this spring, so we've just been really excited to get together and start to build our culture and our team. Julian, early in the first half, you guys really made the revolver offense look uncomfortable. What do you think was the secret to that? Uh, just putting effort into the small things. That's one thing we really emphasize on our team. And, uh, you know, I think we did a pretty good job of that. But in the second half, I think we can really step it up. Julian, who is the artist behind the jersey that you're sporting today? Uh, that would be Phil Murray and Will Chen. And does that say sockeye in a foreign language? Uh, a rough translation, yes. Uh, I believe it's fish balls. Well, it's, it's, uh, it's close. Close so. enough. Julian, thank you so much for the time. Uh, congrats on the good first half and good seeing you back out. Why aren't you playing, by the way? Uh, I had surgery on my medial meniscus about four months ago, so I'm um, trying to get back. Uh, hopefully, we'll, I'll be ready for our next tournament. Good luck with the rehab. We'll see you soon. Thanks so much. That's Julian Hausman from Seattle. Sockeye, 8-5. Seattle leads the defending national champion, San Francisco, at the half here in the first, first men's semi at the U.S. Open. Well, you wouldn't think it because of the score. The game actually began with Revolver getting a break on Sockeye. But after that, the tide seriously turned. Revolver will receive to start the second half. But Ian Toner, the Seattle defense, caused some mistakes. The Revolver offense not quite in sync. And you can see the score 8-5. It's a result of all this, uh, all these plays. Yeah, Seattle's been in control this almost this entire game as we saw things get off to a great start here. Justin Lim, four goals, catching this deep shot from Matt Rader. And eventually, Disc is going to be worked into the end zone to Mark Burton. Or rather, Donnie Clark. And then Seattle striking deep on the turnover. Reed Koss finding Hussein Carnegie. Trent Dillon had streak, been streaking deep as soon as the disc was turned over. Another break opportunity here. See the revolver O-line forced to play a lot of D in this game in the early going. And Justin Lim, did you imagine Justin Lim having such a big impact on this game? Definitely didn't. He's been a versatile part of their offense for a few years now, but I think he's developed into a more mature and more confident and more versatile player. And he's become Phil Murray's favorite target this half. That was just one of several layout scores from Lim. That was one that was a nice and easy shot to the chest. And then this play where Byron Liu got not one, but two deflections. And yet neither time created a turnover. Yeah, Byron's going to want to forget this point. Two opportunities to get the block and give his team the disc. Perhaps should have caught the first one. The second one, a great effort. Just unfortunate result. At the half, it's Seattle 8, San Francisco 5. Second half for the first men's semi coming up from Rhode Island. 
Sakai leads Revolver 8-5 at the half, and we're joined down on the field by Yokawa Oka, who has transformed himself from a defensive handler defender to a coach on the sideline. Yo, what has that transition been like for you? It's been really exciting. I enjoy uh, giving the sideline feedback to the teams uh, and being an impact from there. And it's also great to be part of both the O and D lines. Now, Yo, what? Sorry, sorry. And your team has had a lot of transitions this year, especially on offense. How do you feel those kinks are gradually getting sorted out? Well, I think that we have a lot of new faces on both O and D lines, and we're trying to figure out what the right mix of players are. And so this is the first step in that. Yo, what's the Sakai defense doing to kind of slow things down for your offensive unit? I think that they're very familiar on how we run our offense, and so they have a lot of strategies that step into the lane, uh, take away our spacing, and we're going to adjust to that with uh, some, some more handler movement. And your primary message to the team before the second half was what? Hey, let's play with intensity, humility, and discipline, and that's, uh, the play will take care of itself. I've heard that message before from a revolver coach. Yo, Kawaoka, you fit right in. Thanks so much for the time. Good luck in the second half. Thank you, guys. Mike Payne, longtime leader. He's still involved with the revolver. He was here the past couple of days. Yokawa Oka in charge this weekend as the revolver looks to come back. Seattle leads San Francisco 8 5. We're about to start the second half, but you look at the scoring summary. Not sure anyone would have thought Justin Lim would have four times as many goals as Joel Schlockett in the first half. Justin Lim taking on a much larger role for this offense, rising to the challenge. Phil Murray, the assist leader for Sockeye. Justin Lim was his favorite target in that first half. This would be a great early season win for Seattle Sockeye without Danny Karlinski, without Mark Burton. Obviously missing Julian Hausman and, and a few other key and, pieces. And B.J. Sefton, another member sure. of the gold medal team on the sidelines here today, not cleated up. He is present but not playing as Revolver begins the second half on offense. Kasednar, Kearns, and Schlag, the handlers. Higgins, Johnson, Schlockett downfield with Lindsley. And the throw overshoots Lindsley. Schlockett couldn't get there to clean up the trash. Sakai, by the way, only had two turnovers in the entire first half. One of them was on the very first point. Not bad for an early season performance from the fish. Sure thing. And the good old announcer's jinx, some might say. As Hednar reinitiates play, Schlag swings it to Higgins. Schlag's throw way over the top of Kearns, ushered out of bounds by Dillon. Got to wonder if the wind is picking up or swirling a bit more down at field level. That's two throws that have just sailed over the top of revolver receivers in the last 30 seconds. A revolver is without Ashlyn Joy and Robbie Cahill. They're both listed as practice players. Of course, remains to be seen whether one of them might earn a promotion from the practice squad to the game day roster. That's over the top of Kieran Kelly. And each team has turned it over twice on this point. Didn't have a point like this in the first half. Aside from Joy and Cahill being out, Revolvers, of course, without Bo Kittredge and Cassidy Rasmussen. I think two of the top 10 players in the world on any list that anyone would make. Several members of this revolver team, in fact, several members of Seattle, came straight to Rhode Island from London. Chatting with Joel Schlockett and some others, they were in Iceland when the Iceland soccer team beat England, watching it in the big downtown square, I believe in Reykjavik. 
And Revolver punches it in. A hard working hold for San Francisco. I was trying to sneak some glimpses of that Iceland game on the TV in the hall at the office. That's nothing compared to being in Reykjavik with a large percentage of the Icelandic population. And here's the inside shot. Kassedner breaking the mark to Kearns and he's got an easy finish to his buddy, Simon Higgins. In Sort of the body language of everyone on this point suggests fatigue after the four turnover battle. 8-6. Everyone runs some pretty intense track workouts. Hard to simulate the stopping and starting sprinting of a marathon point. Hat trick for Higgins as Kearns picks up his fourth assist. Obviously, Revolver has looked very good at times this weekend. They've struggled in the early season tournament, as you might expect. It'll be interesting to see, Ian. Do they stick with the personnel aligned as it currently is, or do they make some tweaks throughout the season? And I'm not sure if that would be switching a guy like George Stubbs for a guy like Eli Kearns or whatever it might be. They have a lot of options. I think I think both teams will tinker. I, I would expect to see more change from the revolver side than from the sockeye side. I think there are more pieces, more central pieces missing, namely in Cassidy Rasmussen and Bo Kittredge, that are going to change things for that revolver offense. But the sockeye offense, you know, maybe they might pick up a Danny Karlinski, a Joe Sefton but they're still looking solid today. Raider and White left of your screen discussing a foul downfield that I believe was called by White on a Raider push off. I think we have a foul call down the field. Nathan White. Who called it? I don't know. He's calling a foul. Okay, defense called foul, thank you. I, I called the push off. Our hands it's gotta be back to there. Yeah, it's got to be there. There it was. Defense no, Mitch, called foul. Mitch, Mitch, no, it's like this. defense. He had the disc. I no, saw no, it. No, no, it was called before he had the disc. Come in, White. Come on, guys. So Nathan White and Matt Raider, teammates a week ago in London. White has gotten the Raider assignment frequently in the past, as recently as last year's national championship game doing a great job on the large deep threat. I don't know about you. I kind of enjoy watching teammates get irked with each other a little bit. It leads to plays like this as Raider burns white deep for the Seattle score. That's not an easy throw that got to Raider either. That was bending outside in to the opposite side of the third, opposite side of the field, and had to come back into Raider's path. Obviously an easy catch for him, but really Zane Rankin doing the legwork, if you will, on that score. Rankin beginning his second season. Of course, he's from Austin, Texas, but Went to Cal, played for Boost Mobile in the Bay Area, now 24 years old. Launching to Raider, who despite being just 25, is in his ninth season. He was a teenage phenom. A lot of miles on his legs despite being an age of 25, where you think, is it possible Matt Raider hasn't reached his prime yet? Is that possible? I think that's possible and, you know, to your question earlier, how long until Simon commands the respect of a Bo Kittredge? I think the question is how long until Matt Rader commands the respect of a Bo Kittredge? He's been on the scene for a while. He's been playing on the team for a number of years, but I think Rader is just that, just maybe an increment faster than Higgins and maybe an increment closer to Bo. But Bo still is in a league of his own purely because of his speed and athleticism that just commands so much respect. Let me bounce this idea off you. These two teams obviously have played a lot. Both Sockeye and Revolver have been in countless big games. 
Lindsley thought about a shot to Johnson. Now he'll go underneath to him. And Wiseman uses his speed. And it's Kearns on the second effort, taking the goal away from Wiseman. How many San times Francisco. in this wind, Evan, have we seen the importance of following the play? Two minute account. And that's Eli Kearns, someone hustling from the central handler spot down there to make that play. That's Seattle 9, San Francisco 7. So Christian Johnson will get the assist with a little help from both the defender and Wiseman. Going back to the conversation, Kittredge versus Raider. It's felt like in a lot of big games, and Revolver's talked a lot about how they want to transform these stars into role players. But there have been several big games where Kittredge has kind of taken over. Exactly. And Raider has seemed to play more of the team game in those big games compared to a guy like Kittredge. Not to say Raider can't take over a game, because clearly we've seen that. But, but is it fair for me to perceive that that's the slight difference between them at this stage? I wonder if the credit there is due to Raider filling the team role or to Raider, I, I guess marginalized is too strong a word, but uh, his impact being negated by the defense that someone like a Kittredge or even a Nathan White can play on. Him. Big wind up here, Montague seeking Rankin and just a quick example of Simon Montague's prowess. A majestic shot from the former Carlton handling star. And this is a simple vert stack play that a number of teams have in their arsenal. You come in a few steps, the thrower shares the pump fake to communicate to the receiver that it's time to change your cut. And Montague, one of the top throwers in the men's division, is able to put that on the money. There's some teams out there that might say, okay, let's avoid throwing deep to the Stubbs matchup. Clearly, Sockeye has not said those words. And Zane Rankin is a great deep threat in, in, in his own right. We, we've talked about the wealth of experience that he has for someone of his age, having won a world championship with the under 23 team last summer, um, having played in big games with Sockeye to date. He has speed and power that other teams need to respect as well. And when you, you have a thrower like Montague combined with him, able to put perfect hucks over the stack, slightly to the break side, <laughs> that's just difficult to defend. 20 seconds to pull. Stay on side. Seattle Sockeye has only been broken once in this game. That was in the very first point. And an offsides has been called. There was one on revolver earlier and now one here on Seattle. Offside. Second offsides penalty is when right, your one offside warning. it becomes an issue. Wonder if Revolver has enough in the tank to break Seattle. They need to do it three times to win. Keep pulling, ready? I haven't seen them really slow down the Seattle offense. You need a bigger, more effective mark on Simon Montague. I think he's been able to break the market well and distribute as he'd like. Maybe you consider putting someone like a Nathan White on Simon Montague, but then that begs the question, okay, what big body do you put on Matt Raider downfield? Someone has to guard Rankin too, remember. Kearns breaks the mark. Lindsley looking for Wiseman. Wiseman! Unable to get there. We saw that in the first half. Eli Kearns with that inside shot shooting just a bit too far deep. And this one from Lindsley with a similar outcome. Such a challenging throw. Oh, and Wiseman, not sure if he left his feet just perhaps a second too early, but he still got a hand on that one as well. Here's Duncan Lynn, chased by Kearns. Lynn needs a reset. 
up the line. Oh, Koss running with it past Schlockett to Dillon. To the end zone, Tony Clark is there. Another break for the fish, 11-7. If I'm the San Francisco O-line, I am not happy with defense after that turnover. That was four side throw after four side throw after four side throw. Defenders just not able to protect the four side or the four side cone, which is kind of where you need to draw that final line in the sand and say, all right, this is the one place I'm not gonna get beat. Right up the line, Dylan picks up the assist. What's your vision for how Trent Dillon is going to ultimately fit in and leave his mark on Seattle Sockeye this year and going forward? Well, as we said, you know, it's going to be great to see him transition from the player who has so much responsibility as a captain and a leader to more of a role player. And I think he's going to be able to excel in frustrating a Danny Karlinski or some and practice for Sakai but in a tournament he's going to be frustrating uh, an Eli Kearns or someone of that nature you know that handler that defender who's always in your shorts always following you every step all over the field Trent Dillon stays on the field for back-to-back -back points here Murray, Kelly, Chen, Carnegie, Lim, all out there too with Harkness. Revolver, Higgins, Schlag, Lindsley, Kasednar, Johnson, Kearns, and Schlockett. Cutting from the sides of the field toward the middle of the field, Revolver. And, oh, Kasednar got lucky there. He slowed down. And then he put it right on the money to Johnson. Big hit from Carnegie. But it's Christian Johnson, the dark side alum, wearing the black jersey and catching goals for Revolver. Carnegie way closer than I expected on that bid. Yes. Johnson started to slow up as the disc was hanging a slight bit. And Murray actually had a shot at that under to Kassedner. And here's that throw sitting on a shelf. Johnson starts to slow up and Hussein Carnegie awfully close to getting a hand on that one. Hussein Carnegie chasing and bidding. He's got some hops. Something Hussein has done quite a bit in the AUDL as well as those two have been opponents as Christian has played on the Spiders and Flamethrowers. So 11-8 now. After Revolver gets back on track following the Seattle break. Can Revolver stifle the Seattle O-line led by Montague? Whether it was with Carlton or Sub-Zero, Montague has always been a leader of his team's offense. Murray using the space downfield. And he turns it over. Really tried to force it to Russell. And Lou was very close to him. Raider kind of sized that up just off the mark. Looking long and it's caught. <laughs> Seth Reinhardt makes his biggest catch as a member of Revolver. And that's an old Ironside connection there. George Stubbs picking up and ripping deep to his former Boston teammate, both men now living in the Bay Area. Seth Reinhardt, as he's falling backwards with Raider coming over and giving chase. Not high percentage by any means. And Raider almost got a paw on it. Is it possible Raider 
nicked this disc right before Reinhardt caught it? I think it is. Well, there's not, a break. Not the most graceful catch, but it's a break nonetheless, and San Francisco pulls back within two. One of the first mistakes we've seen from the Seattle offense in the second half. I got, oh really, I got called second. I'm just joking. So we see a conversation there between Grant Lindsley and Sam Canner. Two were teammates at Carleton College. All right, we are Canner. now in between point timing. Looked like a timeout was called down in the field. Mentioned Canner and Lindsley, one from the ultimate hotbed, Amherst, Massachusetts, the other from Atlanta, Georgia. Michael Baccarini and Tina Booth, both impacting those careers. More body! Let's go! Come on, I just don't want to give up. Like, Where's the fire? Let's go, let's go. 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 let us go let us go Twenty to pull. Fourteen. Eleven nine. And we'll see if the intensity, humility, and discipline can get Revolver back into the game. Big gainer from O'Brien to Montague in the first row. And Montague airs it out again, looking for Raider. Cohen nearby. Raider tipped it. And it's intercepted by White to Hagen. Bayless swings it. Kevin Cox. Guys like Marcy and Cox and Bayless. Unable to get the disc moving. White was hand blocked by Raider. Back to Montague to the end zone. Fifth goal of the game for Justin Lim. And Seattle dodges a bullet, able to hold after turning it over on the deep shot. We see White looking for his next option in Raider. Just laying out on the mark, understanding exactly where Nathan White wanted to go, forcing the turnover. And Montague with a nice little elevator backhand to Justin Lim. Another Carlton connection there, this one on Sakai. Heck of a defensive play there from Raider. Raiders certainly happy with that one. I know one of the final points of the 2015 men's final, Nathan White got a layout point block on a Raider Huck attempt. So he's certainly happy to get one back on White. They're both spectacular players. Justin Lim is having a great game on the stat sheet. And I see Montague, four assists. Doesn't begin to tell the story of his impact on this game. So the Seattle Sockeye D line back out there, led by Koss, Chen, Carnegie, Harkness, Lynn, Russell, and Dillon. Revolver has Kearns, Schlag, Schlockett. They're handling, and Lindsley looking long for Higgins. And it is not close. Oh, 
Koss didn't have a reset and threw it away. Turns to Schlockett. Both of these offenses doing a great job communicating with their pump fakes, telling cutters when to plant, when to change direction. As this one goes into the end zone for Goal Schlockett himself. We see Lindsley pump there. Pump Kearns to get him into his next movement. And then an inside shot to Schlackett right on the goal line. Doesn't need much space to get free. That was a, a strange feeling to that point. The revolver deep shot, which was as poorly timed as you see from revolver. Right. And then Sakai basically stranded Reed Koss on that corner. Presumably they expected something to open up downfield, but really nothing did, and his swing shot sailed on him. And you know, I understand Reed's a great thrower. I think he can hit that swing shot even in tough wind more frequently than not. But I was a little surprised to see him take the gamble of that really long range swing as opposed to just punting the disc and making sure that Revolver had to work 50 plus yards to get back down the field. So Revolver back within two, Stubbs with a massive pull. You know, one name that Revolver is without today that we haven't mentioned yet, but certainly worthy mentioning when they're on defense is Russell Wynn, who was a gold medalist for Team USA men's for Alex Gestier and Ben Van Hoovelen, and well, there's a turnover. Overthrow on, from Rankin gives George Greg. Dubs Greg. and Greg Cohen and the Revolver D-line a chance. Cohen had taken off with Raider nearby. Stubbs instead took the easier swing. Evan, you were asking earlier what kind of role is Dylan going to fill for Sakai as this one goes deep to Canner. Back of the end zone. He was able to get that foot in bounds. Revolver's second break of the half makes it 12-11. Just when we thought this game was out of reach for San Francisco, they've capitalized on Sakai mistakes that we weren't seeing earlier as Greg Cohen catches this under and sees Canner going deep. Montague not even attempting to make a play after Canner curls deep. And he does a good job towing that back line. But to get back to your comment about Revolver missing Russell Wynn and wondering how Trent Dillon is going to fit into Sakai, I think Dillon is going to play the same role that Russell Wynn does for this Revolver defense except for Sakai. I think he's going to be that very frustrating, persistent, aggressive, physical defender who challenges that every reset matchup. Certainly a guy with the disc skills to make a difference after a turn as well. Here's the stat for you. Sakai had turned the disc over just four times in the first 19 points. Sakai's turned the disc over four times in the last four points. I'll say that's probably why this is a one goal game at this point. So things have tightened up here in this first men's semifinal. Winner of this will play the winner of Machine and Ironside later today. It's a six o'clock start time on ESPN3. At 3.30, women's semifinal action, Riot and Molly Brown. O'Brien, hestered by Marcy, swings it, Montague. Thought about it. Low throw for Russell. White really selling out to make sure that that deep shot, even though it was just a fake from Montague, didn't get off. Uh, Clark was open, but the disc soared past him. Functions like a punt. The win. Oh, yeah. Hard to, hard to blame Clark for that one completely because you could see it zooming in and all of a sudden just hit a patch of wind and popped up and changed elevation. White takes a shot. Marcelo Sanchez was there, but he couldn't come up with it. 
Will Ballmer gives it this back. Montague not happy about that bid from Nathan White. Shoulder went straight into his back. Take your time, you good? And I think he's upset because, you know, there's also potential for a serious knee or ankle injury as he's going to the ground. I think Montague has every right to be upset in that situation. All right, we're set. In on one. And I do like this matchup change, putting the larger mark of white on Montague. Looking long for Lim. And revolver there for the D. That was Zach Travis, the product of Harvard. Zach Travis with a deeper revolver. San Francisco has a chance to tie this thing. You'd think he might have learned a lesson from his teammate Byron Liu earlier this yeah. game and tried to catch that one. What if Caldwell had caught that clean? I think that use it we're hearing from Yo Kawaoka is a, perhaps an instruction to burn a timeout here. White takes the shot. Travis is there. He's got it. Bookends to tie it up. What a point for the former Redline star, Zach Travis. And here's White just barely getting power position on Montague. Picks up, shoots deep. Kevin Cox giving chase as well. And Travis is able to survive the ground contact, keep his hand under the disc, even though it kind of turns over in his hand. Doesn't quite reach the ground. A really tough throw in this win from Nathan White. And a great finish from Travis with the grab. Timeout on the field. Seattle takes their second and final timeout of the second half. So we're even at 12. I believe Zach Travis was a freshman at Harvard when Jack Marsh was a senior. Jack Marsh, a longtime player with New York Pony in the club game. I got to visit with Jack Marsh earlier this week in St. Louis, where Jack Marsh, Zach's former college teammate, runs a circus, Circus Flora in St. Louis, that Jack has been involved in for a very long time. Jack Marsh, of course, won a college national title as a fifth year uh, player when he was in law school at University of Wisconsin back in 2007. And for anyone in the Midwest, anyone who's been curious about what Jack Marsh's circus is all about, I can tell you firsthand it was indescribably brilliant and jaw dropping. And I could not recommend anything stronger than Jack Marsh's Circus Flora in St. Louis, which I think has its final show of the season tonight. So unless you're in St. Louis right now, you're gonna have to wait basically a year to see it, but. All right, well, Evan, I'm sorry. I'm not gonna be able to join you for the final two <laughs> broadcasts here. I need to book a flight you really quickly. You have a private quickly. jet? Uh, yeah, I'll just get Mark Cuban on the phone. It, uh, it was incredible. And Jack actually got me involved and my voice involved in the show, which was an incredible honor. There's a baseball theme so he asked me to record some baseball sound bites uh, as play-by-play -play clips. And there was a fun script, and we went back and forth. It was an honor to be involved and get a chance to see the show. Uh, a very unique member of the ultimate community, Jack Marsh. Here's Seattle looking to right the ship. O'Brien didn't put enough on it. And he I had think, Montague open. I think that speaks to the difficulty of throwing in that direction in these in these conditions. You know, O'Brien unmarked, an open throw, doing what he can to try and keep it up. Unfortunately, hitting the turf earlier than expected, and that just makes Nathan White's previous throw, deep shot to Zach Travis, that much more impressive. Greg Cohen is wide open deep. 
Justin Lim, the closest defender. This is all Cohen. Lim drops off. Revolver on the verge of their first lead since 1-0. Oh, it is in the end zone. It's Caldwell denying the easy score. You got to be kidding me. 39 years young, still making plays like this. And as we return live, a huge huck the other way, tracked by Rankin. An outrageous turnaround here in the semis. Seattle up by one. No disrespect to Mike Caldwell. That was a fantastic block. It's really challenging to have your eyes on the receiver and also have that peripheral vision to know when to start making the jump and get that block. But I think George Stubbs, that's a mistake that he doesn't make that often, especially on the goal line with the game potentially on the line. As we see in our replay here after that turnover, Sakai's offense just getting back into its regular flow and finding Zane Rankin deep. But if San Francisco ends up losing this game, they can't say they didn't have the chances. George Stubbs with the disc on the goal line and Mike Caldwell rising to the challenge. When these two teams great together, you think you have some idea of what you're going to see, but the twists and turns any given Sunday can still shock you. Seattle up 11-7, cruising. Revolver ties it up at 12 on, on the doorstep, literally, of retaking the lead. And the all-world superstar Stubbs with the mistake. Now Revolver's offense needs to go the full 70 against this sockeye D-line. Big 30-yard gainer. And Higgins launches. Johnson had it and lost it. And then hand block Carnegie in the goal line. What action. And then Wallace knocks down the shot of Kassendar. And then Seattle throws it away. You could not script a sequence like this. Both teams need and to take a collective breath. As we see Kassedner on the goal line here and Wallace with the really heads up, active, adaptive mark. And the deep shot hauled in by Grant Lindsley. We know we missed the start of it. We'll show you it in full in a moment as Revolver ties it up 13-all. Lindsley with a goal from Kearns. And Kearns putting this one on the money on the back line after Lindsley is already 20 plus yards deep. Well, these last two points have been some kind of theater. Not nearly as many turnovers as both team would like, but they are persevering, and this one's coming down to the wire, Evan. So 13 all. It's a game to two. Second time today we've been in this spot, although interestingly here the soft cap is not on yet. So if we're tied at 14, we will likely play to 16. If we are tied at 14 before the soft cap horn goes off. Correction. We'll still be playing to 16 in that instance. The cap rules could be simpler. That is for sure. Sometimes it feels like you need a cryptographer to figure it out. Oh, Sanchez nearly with the D gets up to try to put a mark on Rankin. A roundabout mark. 
And Rankin airs it out. It's a laser beam. Montague turns on the Jets, but he's not that fast. Sockeye turnover on the end zone look. You know, Montague is a great athlete, but I think that's something that Revolver wants. They want someone like Zane Rankin taking the deep shots and Montague being forced out of the handler set and not being able to distribute in that situation. White will initiate. Another chapter in this great rivalry, Sockeye and Revolver, and it's the bidding Donnie Clark with a game-changing D on the sideline. On a break side undercut, no less. An area where there's much less responsibility, but you see the speed of Clark able to make that block and get Sakai the disc back. Over the top, yes. Raider from Montague. And it's Seattle that scores to go up by one at 14 13. At Seattle 14, San Francisco 13. Montague with the stall count rising, sees White taking a few extra steps off. Not as close to Raider as he could have been, perhaps looking to help with some other defensive responsibilities in the stack. And Raider's pretty happy about that one. And it was the incredible D from Donnie Clark that set it up. Just a few minutes after this game, so don't go anywhere. A layout block on an undercut to the break side. Not the most common turnover you see. Check this. Didn't get any more horizontal than that. Donnie Clark with the D. Montague to Raider for the goal. Seattle wins if they break here. These are the repetitions under pressure that make coming to a tournament like this early in the season so valuable. Revolver, of course, won the U.S. Open last year, won the Triple Crown, the Pro Flight Finale, and uh, Club Nationals, too. Higgins keeps it alive in the red zone to Kearns. To the end zone for Schlockett. What a throw from Eli Kearns. I don't know how far he stepped back with his right foot, but it was more of a reach around release with his right arm and wrist. As Higgins here will reset. And Duncan Lynn with that backhand force and Kearns with the quick release. Fourteen all, game to sixteen. Got a pretty good sample size, twenty-eight points in. Evaluate Eli Kearns for Revolver, Simon Montague for Seattle. I think Eli wants some of those early Huck turnovers back. We look at how close this game is. That could be the margin between this game already being over and us proceeding deeper into overtime. Simon Montague has been incredibly efficient. I think he's done a good job distributing, finding ways to get open in the backfield, hitting nearly all of his spots. I think they're both doing really remarkable jobs in the central handler position for both teams. 
So this is not universe point here. Regardless of who scores, the other side will get a chance. Seattle has the edge considering Revolver needs to break. Cohen chasing Raider with an active mark. O'Brien, Givol the active mark. And now it's Montague downfield with Canner by his side. And a pick downfield. You don't know where we'll be in a few months from now, but who knows? Maybe a game like this would decide who's the number one seed going into the action in Rockford. Seattle is in. 15-14, Sockeye back up by one. That wouldn't surprise me, Evan. And once again, we see Zane Rankin getting loose deep. And he kind of plants under, takes off deep. Really just getting the better of the Stubbs matchup this game. And you could see right there at the tail end of that replay, Stubbs frustrated with himself. O'Brien picks up the assist. Third goal for Rankin, give him the hat trick. And you talked about Kearns and, and what he's perhaps wanted back. Montague's made maybe one mistake or two mistakes, but he has been the anchor of everything Sockeye's done offensively. No question. And it'll be interesting to see how much more efficient the Sockeye offense could be if he's got the support or if he's playing support for someone like a Danny Karlinski at a future tournament. It depends on what kind of game Seattle wants to play. Danny might be a little more conservative, a little more steady in the short game. Simon, though, has perhaps a, a level of explosiveness that Karlinski doesn't. And there, Lindsley with a terrible drop. Seattle on the brink of a trip to the U.S. Open Finals. And Duncan Lynn takes a timeout. <laughs> what are we saying? Okay, we're saying six. Thank you. Thank you. Final 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 you don't want to see a game like this decided by a drop like that. <laughs> but Seattle has it on the doorstep of a win. Really just a simple four side under. Lindsley's made that grab a thousand times. Let's put uh, Harkness. Wait, no. Justin in the front. Bill two. Matty Russ back. If we're bail, okay? Hey, hey the bail is a hammer to that corner. Okay. okay. Hey. What we're doing? We're looking, we're looking Justin first. Perfect. Okay. If not, he is at six. Hey, okay, sorry. Not, immediately immediately to read. Yeah, yeah. Breathe. Take a breath. Ready? One, two, three, breath. Hey, come on, breathe. Hey, sad dude on the two. One, two. Sad dude. So if I can decipher that huddle discussion correctly, I think they're going to look at Justin Lim, then they're going to look at Reed Koss, and if all else fails, they're going to throw a hammer to the back corner. It's good to have options. Coming in six. In on six. Coming in six. If the stall count was zero or one, they'd have more opportunities to survey the situation. San Francisco needs a D here to stay alive. It's been a sloppy second half from both sides. They do get the reset to Koss. And Koss throws it away. Bit too greedy on that inside shot. I think there was a window for Lim, but he threw it with too much outside in edge and too much velocity as well. Lindsley to Higgins. Higgins unleashes. This is to the end zone and it is caught. 
Michael Spear ties it up 15 all for the second straight semifinal here in Rhode Island. We are going the distance. Koss has Lim, but you gotta wonder if Lindsley being so close to Lim at the point of release made Koss throw it a little harder than he would have liked. And then Michael Spear coming over from Chain Lightning, tracking this shot from Simon Higgins perfectly. I don't know if he knew Phil Murray was coming on his backside, but he does what he needed to do to hold position and come down with the hold for the revolver offense. Thank goodness we don't call this a tie at 15 all. <laughs> It has not been the cleanest game these two sides have ever played. The second half has been, frankly, a turnover fest. I got unofficially 24 total turnovers in the second half. Sockeye's offensive line with Mario O'Brien, Mike Caldwell, Justin Lim, Zane Rankin. Matt Rader, Donnie Clark, and of course, Simon Montague. Stubbs, White, Cohen, Joel Schlockett out there for the D point with Lucas Dahlman, Byron Liu, and Sam Canner. May only be July, but this is still pretty intense between these two great powers in ultimate. Up the line, O'Brien resets for Montague. Gets the swing, Caldwell tracks it down and gets backpacked by Dolman. Doesn't make a call, keeps the point alive and Sockeye has knocked out Revolver. Montague to Raider. It may only be July 3rd, but we can say definitively, Revolver will not repeat in the Triple Crown in 2016. Seattle 16, Revolver 15 is your final in the first men's semi. And Dolman perhaps getting a bit carried away with that bid coming down on Caldwell more than he may have liked, and Montague finishing with another one of his many varied release points. A high release flick above his shoulder going into the hands of Matt Rader. And Revolver at least without Bo Kittredge and Cassidy Rasmussen, looking perhaps as mortal as they've looked in a few years. And Russell Wynn, and Ashlyn Joy, and Robbie Cahill. And there will be questions. Final score, 16-15. Dramatic fashion. Simon Montague to Matt Rader to close it out. We'll be back to Rhode Island in a moment. Another chapter in this great rivalry has unfolded before our eyes, and it was a memorable one. Plenty of wrinkles to it. Seattle sockeye over San Francisco revolver by the slimmest of margins. The discraft play of the game was the play that took us to the half. And in a game that was decided by one, you look back at this and wonder if Byron Liu had simply caught the disc in either of these situations, how a game might have been different. Certainly wonder. I think he had a better chance of actually catching the first block, but the second one, he makes a tremendous play. You see him here making up the ground after being on the ground, chasing down this huck able to get a hand on this deep shot, but Justin Lim sticks with it. Full extension layout grab, and Sakai was able to take half 
on San Francisco Revolver on their way to a 16-15 victory. There were so many plays in this game. Think back to the game tied at 12. Revolver on the verge of taking a lead and Mike Caldwell got the D on George Stubbs' throw on the goal line. That changed things considerably too, but you know, more than 20 turnovers in the second half after a pretty cleanly played first half. Uh, just, a, just a tremendous battle. And it will be Seattle Sockeye against either Chicago or Boston in the men's final tomorrow afternoon here at URI. A word from our sponsors here, and we will be back with interviews after this break. The 2016 U.S. Open Ultimate Championships are presented by Discraft Ultra Star, the official disc of USA Ultimate. Discraft Ultra Star is now available at over 1,900 U.S. retail locations, including all Dick Sporting Goods and Hibbit Sports Stores. Buy Discover Newport. Choose your own adventure in Newport, Rhode Island. Get the inside scoop on where to stay and where to play at discovernewport.org. And by USA Ultimate, the national governing body for the sport of Ultimate in the United States. For more information or to find out where to play Ultimate in your area, visit usaultimate.org. 16-15, Sakai over Revolver. Seattle head coach Roger Kraft joins us down on the field. And coach, you've seen a lot of chapters of this rivalry. I know it's not September or October, but how did this one compare in terms of intensity down there? Intensity was great. Uh, it is early season, so um, we'll see. What did you like from your team today? Uh, the focus on our own team and nothing else around us. Coach, talk about Simon Montague's role in guiding the offense, especially with Danny not present here with your offense this weekend. Mostly I was just smiling because I coached that guy in seventh grade and all through high school, so it was enjoyable. And you didn't coach Mike Caldwell when he was in seventh grade, though. He he coached he still me. Make, he's still making <laughs> plays. How is he doing this at 39 years old? I, I, I just turned 40, so I have no idea, actually. Well, actually, I think it's just an insane work ethic, actually, and focus by Mike over the years. Does it make you wonder why you're not still out on the field? Come on, man. <laughs> Can I ask who designed that T-shirt? I don't know. Oh, I think it was Will Chen or the Fishballs God, maybe. I'm not sure. What uh, What are your thoughts about either uh, rematching with Machine tomorrow or perhaps getting a first shot of 2016 with Boston Ironside? Again, it's just about us. I don't really care. Come on, you gotta be excited about playing a particular team. Never, I'm just excited about talking with you. You guys have the coach talk really well. You don't say anything, it's, it's really <laughs> impressive. Yep, I'm a Patriots fan, man, come on. Me too, I respect that. Roger Crafts, congrats on the win, appreciate your time. We'll see you tomorrow. Thanks, man. That's Roger Crafts, the sock guy really has never left. I don't know about the return, but they have never left. Seattle uh, wins. The first meeting over Revolver this year. And uh, th I mean, this will be an interesting game to dissect for a long time going forward. These teams will certainly see each other again. A look at the bracket. We'll see Boston Ironside and Chicago Machine later tonight. These are the four finalists, uh, four semifinalists, I should say, from Frisco last fall. Yeah, Saka and Revolver are actually facing each other in the finals, Machine and Ironside. Both teams that lost in the semifinals in the national championships last year. Machine gaining some firepower with Goose Helton and Brett Matsuka joining the team on Saturday after missing Friday competition. And Ironside loading up with a number of talented players for their 2016 campaign. Excited to see how they perform together tonight. And that'll do it for the first men's semifinal. Women's semi begins about an hour from now. Molly Brown and Ryan. But for now, we say so long from Meade Stadium at the campus of University of Rhode Island. For Ian Toner, this is Evan Leffler. What a game this was. We thought it would be great, and it lived up to the billing. 16-15, Sockeye over Evolver. You can watch it all on replay on watchespn.com or by downloading the Watch ESPN app. We appreciate you being with us on this Independence Day Eve. It's been a presentation of ESPN.